Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining. So what I'm here to do today is talk to you about airflow and coffee roasting. As kind of mentioned, my name is Rob. Um, a quick disclaimer before we really dive into this. So uh, whenever we talk about anything related to coffee roasting, there are a billion variables, uh, probably not literally, mostly figuratively, um, but there's a ton of variables that come to play. And so it's going to be difficult to answer every single possible variable in terms of you know, what altitude are you roasting at? What's your air's humidity? Uh, what's the barometric pressure, air temperature, backflow issues in your roaster? How long is your vent pipe? All of these sorts of things. You know, what year was your roaster manufactured? How efficiently is your fan working still? All these things come into play. And so what I'm trying to do is more deliver concepts that you can then take and cross apply to what you're doing. Uh, but it's probably not going to answer every single specific situation that may come up. So that's always the disclaimer I want to start with. Um, I also want to point out to you that I am a coffee roaster and I'm not a scientist. So I am using instruments that I have available to me to take measurements to help kind of make some sort of general statements. Uh, but I am not producing a white paper on this, nor is it getting published in any sort of uh, journal um, of scientific measure. So just kind of want to point those things out. Uh, another quick thing is something that I forgot, but I'm sure we'll get back around to. So let's just dive right in. First, I want to start by covering some basics about how airflow moves inside of roasting systems. And then we're going to go on from there to just kind of build upon those basics. So the first thing is, this is the traditional airflow within a standard drum roaster. All of those are loaded statements, traditional standard. This is one way that air flows through a lot of different drum roasters. So you've got the flames down here, the hot air then rises inside of the hot air. That air is brought around the sides of the drum up to the top, and all of that air, top and bottom, is then sucked into the perforated back part of the drum. Of course, if you have a perforated drum, this happens a little bit differently as the air is just kind of moving up through everything. I just did a hand gesture that I realized you can't see. Uh, all of it's moving up through uh, if it's perforated, but this is just kind of the typical way. You'll notice the color differences from the top to the bottom. That is because the air does stray a significant amount inside the hot box uh, where the drum is spinning. Uh, on my little three kilo roaster, which you can see in the background back here, uh, we've got a 100 degrees centigrade temperature difference from the top part of the drum to the bottom part of the drum, which is pretty significant. So just note that it's not pulling uniform temperature air through. Um, it's pulling air through at disuniform um, temperatures. This is an example of a Diedrich airflow, which is a little bit different. On the Diedrich, all the air goes up around the drum, and then it comes down through the plenum uh, through the drum and then exhaust out the back. That's not every Diedrich, but that is um, some of the Diedrichs, uh, some of the smaller ones in particular, right? So it's a variation on a theme. Okay, air, once again, hot air goes through the coffee. In this case, all of it's going up and around and through. So perhaps maybe it's not as disuniform temperature of air, but who knows, right? And then this is an example of the recirculating roaster loring. Uh, here you've got the hot air coming from the cyclone down through the S duct, hitting a diffusion plate in the back to spread that hot air out. It spreads out, it, oops, sorry, sensitive mouse. It gets pulled through the coffee, hits the plenum, goes back to the exhaust air chute, which takes it back to the cyclone where it does its thing. So this is how airflow generally works in coffee roasting systems. And one of the things that we definitely want to make sure to note is that hot air is nearly always being pulled through to help roast the coffee. Hot airflow is, in fact, the dominant way in which heat transfer happens in a coffee roasting system, at least in modern systems. Uh, conduction is there, but it's not nearly as quick and efficient in terms of delivering the heat energy to the coffee. So convection is doing the bulk of the work. Uh, so convection being that hot airflow moving through. Uh, there we go. In some accounts, you'll see 70%. So by some accounts, you'll see 80% in terms of the percentage that is convection. It's going to be roaster dependent and very roaster specific. And knowing exactly how much may or may not change too much about what you're doing because we don't roast with numbers in that way. Um, but it is significant to know that it is the, the dominant way in which heat energy moves through the coffee. Even when the roaster is not pulling much air, convection and hot air is doing a lot of the roasting. So for your enjoyment, <clears throat> Uh, this is three different roasters, all of which were loaded to the same percentage of load, charged to the same relative charge temperature for that roaster for that size. I drop the coffee in, I turn off the burner, I turn off the airflow. And so the only thing that's there is the heat energy from the metal inside the system. 
uh, and the heat energy that is in the hot air that's trapped inside the drum that the beans are constantly being thrown up into to absorb some of that energy. Now, you can see the bean temperatures get up a little bit above 100 centigrade before they start to really plateau and fall off. Uh, you will see that the air temperatures drop dramatically, uh, but then stay above the bean temperature pretty much the whole time. So we are still seeing that the air is hot and is distributing heat energy to that coffee. Otherwise, the hot air would remain stable. So uh, that is, I think, really, really interesting. So hot air, even when there's no airflow going through, is actually still doing work in the coffee roaster. And that's one of the things that I kind of want to point out. When we talk about uh, convective heat energy transfer, it's not like, oh, well, I, I don't have as much airflow moving through the roaster, so I have less convection. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, to lower the convective uh, amount of energy going into the beans, the only way to really do that is to mess with the drum speed, but we'll kind of come back and touch on that. Uh, I threw this one in for fun. Uh, this is a larger roasting machine, so all of these that you see grouped together are in the like sub five kilo range. Uh, this one is a 35 kilo coffee roaster, and you can see a very similar thing happening. Uh, in terms of all of this, but you know, there's less energy to take on those 35 kilo. So, another thing to pay attention to is that the rate of heat energy transfer is going to be related to the temperature difference. I submit to you, for an example, an Akawa roast. Uh, here, I've put a bean probe uh, thermocouple inside the chamber where I found a spot where there's not as much airflow interference. And I did a stable inlet temperature. So the stable inlet temperature is just pumping the same you know, temperature air in pretty much the whole time. What we see is that the exhaust air rises to a certain amount and then kind of plateaus. And we see the bean temperature rising uh, to a certain distance from the inlet temperature and then also plateauing. Uh, it's a great way to get a constantly declining rate of rise. It may not be the best way to roast coffee. Just throwing that out there. But you know the graphs look you know, kind of nice in that sense, I guess. Uh, but once again, the bigger the temperature difference, so the farther everything away is from this inlet temperature, the faster the coffee is roasting because the temperature difference is greater. As the temperature difference becomes smaller, the amount of energy exchanged becomes less. So the rate of heat exchange or the rate of rise is correlated to the temperature difference between the beans that you're roasting and the system in which you're putting them in, in particular the air temperature. Uh, this is a similar experiment that's done on a drum roaster. Basically, I took the air temp up to a, right around here. I don't remember exactly what temperature that is and tried to hold it as flat as I could. Um, here you can see prolonged periods where I'm pulling the dryer. Uh, most of that was just me doing some other data recording. So forgive the little jumpy line there. But for the most part, we kept the air temperature stable. And what that resulted in was us able to get about a seven minute development time to a little bit beyond second crack. Um, not that you would want to roast this way, just once again showing the idea that the bigger the temperature difference, the larger the rate of rise or the rate of heat exchange, the smaller the temperature difference, the smaller the rate of heat exchange. So rate of heat transfer informs us of rate of rise. Just kind of throwing that out there. All right, so let's talk about convective heat energy before the roast. I'm gonna pause to take a quick drink of water, make it dramatic. All right. So before the roast begins, when we talk about charging or we talk about between batch protocol or preheating or these sorts of things before we're starting the roast, we often think about the temperature of the metal. And we don't usually, you know, there's a few roasters where this is uh, different. Like for example, the Alio Bullet, and from what I understand, the Bellwether measured the temperature of the actual metal on it. Uh, there's a Stronghold I think does as well. But most of the time when we're measuring charge temperature, we're measuring it off the airflow that's moving through the system. And that's informative of a few things, because what we need to do is give enough time in between the beginning of the day and our first roast or in between the last batch and our next roast to make sure that the entire system has enough heat energy in it. And it's not just the metal that we want to have preheated, but it's actually the air, the air in the hot box in which the drum is spinning, the air in the burner chamber, depending on uh, what sort of style of roast you're using. And the thing is, that you can't really rush your preheating or your between batch protocol. Normally speaking, 45 minutes to an hour is what you need to make sure all the metal has enough heat energy soaked into it, all the air is hot enough, and everything is ready to go. So in a typical roasting system, we often think about the metal getting preheated. And you can see here I've outlined the metal in red. The air is being brought past uh, out of the hot box over the, from the burners down through the drum, and so we're getting direct heat on the drum. Uh, we're also getting convective heat uh, on the inner parts of the drum. 
And once again, we've got convective heat up here, heating the drum as well, heating the metal. Convective heat energy is heating the faceplate, the plenum, the exhaust, everything. It's heating up everything. And we have to make sure that the roaster is plenty hot in terms of the metal having enough energy in order to start the roast. We also have to make sure that the air temperature inside the hot box is hot enough. And we have to make sure that the air temperature inside the drum is hot enough before we charge our first batch. If all the metal was hot enough, but the air wasn't hot enough, you would have an insufficient energy to roast the coffee. Now, during the roast, it gets a little bit more zany. So let's pay some fun attention to this, right? Airflow changes air temperature. So on all the roasts you're going to be seeing today, I use my three kilo US roaster core as the guinea pig. Uh, it's kind of like a traditional drum roaster, so I figured it would apply to the majority of people tuning in here today. It has variable speed drum speed, airflow, uh, and a variable burner. So it's able to tinker with a lot of fun things with that. Uh, so airflow changes the temperature of the air moving through the system. All right, so here you can see at various percentages of fan speed, 25, 50, 75 and 100% fan speed, variations in terms of how quickly I was able to get to second crack. Now, I chose the beginning of second crack as a model because in this instance, they all actually ended at the same temperature too. A lot of times, if you're breathing a lot faster or a lot slower than you're used to, you will see temperature skew on your thermocouple. And so it doesn't always mean just because you're ending at the same temperature that you're ending at the same point. So I chose second crack or the beginning of second crack as a great way to judge when it was done. Uh, because that's an audible thing. That's something I can pick up on pretty easily. So at 25%, we had the fastest roast of all of them. Um, you can see that there was a lower turning point, and this is not because it was my first batch of the day. This is actually because the change in airflow was so dramatically lower that it changed how the thermocouple read my turning point. Okay, so it pushed it out just a little bit and down just a little bit. We rebounded from that low turning point to shoot up and have the fastest roast. You can also see that my exhaust temperature is the highest. Uh, and these are all exhaust temperature. We'll get to inlet here in just a minute. So highest exhaust temperature, fastest roast. Um, yeah, quite quick. Then it cascades down. The problem with 25% is I also got scorching because there wasn't sufficient airflow. Uh, the metal was getting overheated. There were hot spots forming. And so I had scorching happen as a result. At 50%, I had a very fast roast, uh, no scorching and turnaround point looks somewhat normal. 75% a little slower, 100% a little slower. And you can see the variation between 75% and 100% fan speed wasn't super significant. It was a little bit, but not that much. <clears throat> Bringing inlet temperatures into view, you can see here that my inlet temperature was also the hottest on my lowest airspeed, uh, followed then by all of them kind of cascading down. Now, in these examples, I was at nine inches of water column, which is the highest gas setting that I have. So I was at full gas setting, my normal charge temp, two kilos in a three kilo machine, hit it off, the, off to the races until I got to second crack. Okay, so that's kind of what happened here. Uh, there was no finessing uh, anything. I just wanted to see which one gave me the most power the most quickly. And you can see that as you lower your air temperature, the burners are able to heat the air more significantly. And so both your inlet temperature, the temperature of the air coming into the back of the drum, and your exhaust temperature are higher as a result. So, by lowering your air speed, you increase the burner's ca capacity to heat the airflow. And so you end up with hotter air. Hotter air, as a result, not too surprising, uh, heats the coffee faster. And since it's heating the coffee faster, you end up with faster roasting, generally speaking. Okay. So I kind of got ahead of myself there. What is the impact of air temperature? Well, the impact of air temperature is that it changes the rate which the temperature, uh, which the beans are roasting. It also changes the burner settings that you need in order to reach your desired endpoint within a certain amount of time. So here, and I don't know what happened with this red batch. I ended up doing a second roast, which you'll see in the next slide. Um, but PR948 uh, had some weird thermocouple readings on my inlet, but nowhere else. So I ended up redoing this roast anyway, and I wasn't super happy with exactly how well I did in terms of matching. But the blue roast was my set point. It was 100% airflow the whole time. And I measured it at about four minutes, and that was just kind of what I used as my benchmark. And I was at 0 0.35 inches water column in terms of my exhaust measurement. So it's measuring the exhaust as it's moving out of the roaster. It's in a three inch diameter pipe. Take that for what you will. When I cut it down to 50%, 
I was at 0.22 inches water calm. So we do have a significant decrease in the flow of air moving out or the pressure that's being read by the magma helix and the exhaust on this machine. Uh, so 100% air versus 50% air, blue is 100%, red is 50%. You'll see that even though my turning point went low, which kind of gave me some pause, I started at nine inches and started dropping down. And then as soon as I saw my turning point get low, I panicked. Nobody ever does that. Uh, brought my burner back up a little bit, and then it started kind of racing above the line. And so I dropped, 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 dropped. Uh, I ended up finishing a little early. My color was really, really quite close on these. Um, I will get to the raw color data here in just a minute. Uh, but my whole bean was basically a match, and my ground was off by about three points of color agtron using the light tells. Okay. Uh, you'll notice, though, that with the lower airflow, in order to roast to the same end color -ish and to roast within the same general timing constraints, I had to use a significantly lower burner setting the whole time. Okay. Because, as you'll see, with the high burner that I was using, my air temp got way too high. And as my air temp got way too high, my roast started to accelerate more quickly, and I had to make accommodations for that. Uh, here you'll see uh, the example of the roast that I did yesterday. Uh, 0.35 inches water column on the uh, original roast. The, in this case, it would be the, sorry, I'm going to move something. Uh, the red one, so they switched colors on us. Uh, the red one being the original roast, the blue one being the one that I re-roasted yesterday, just because I had time and, and felt the urge to try and nail it a little bit closer. You'll see that once again, with that lower airflow, I'm using less burn the whole time. I went a little low here. Um, probably take that out and start at seven inches if I start everything all over, but you know, so it goes. And then I brought my burner down, 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 and ended with uh, pretty much nothing on the gas uh, in order to get it to come out. Uh, this one was within one point of color on the ground and was basically smack on for the, the whole bean color, which is awesome. So it was a, a better match color wise. I hit first crack pretty much at the exact same time and had about the same development time. Uh, and my colors all worked out, so I felt much happier about that. Here they all are. Here they all are together, uh, just to kind of give you some frame of reference. So, once again, what we're building is this idea. So, when you decrease your airflow, the burner is able to keep up with the air you're moving, which means it's able to make that air hotter. By making the air hotter and pulling it through the system you are able to deliver more heat energy to the coffee, which tends to give you a faster roast. If you are trying to match a profile using a lower airflow setting, you have to use significantly lower burner settings to bring your air temperatures down in order to meet the same general timing. Uh, real quick here, you'll note too, uh, I was able to keep my air temperatures pretty much right around each other the whole time. And even though my inlet temperatures were way different, my exhaust temperatures were right around each other the whole time, and I ended up with a very, very similar roast. So I think that that's worth paying attention to as well. My exhaust temperatures, the temperature leaving the system was the same. My bean probe readings were fairly close to the same, and the results were very, very similar, despite having some difference in terms of my inlet temperature. All right, so once again, we're reiterating this. this whole the greater the difference between the air temperature and the bean temperature, the larger the rate of rise. The lower difference between the bean temperature and the air temperature, the smaller the rate of rise. So that's part of why we see the highest rate of rise at the beginning of the roast is because the roaster is hot and the air is hot inside the roaster. We have the most heat energy moving into the system as the air, or into the beans, sorry. As the air temperature and bean temperature come closer and closer together, the rate of temperature increase of the beans decelerates and so our rate of rise goes down. Why the heck are we about to talk about drum speed? And the reason we're gonna talk about drum speed is this. Uh, when we often think of drums, we think of conduction. God, the conductive part of the roaster. Yes, we're finally talking about conduction. The drums are actually designed in order to loft the coffee into the hot airstream. And so when you're lofting the coffee into the hot airstream, you're increasing not only the frequency of exposure, faster drum speed, more exposure, so the beans are getting chucked up more frequently, you're also uh, changing the height of the loft of the beans into the hot airflow stream. And by lofting them higher uh, and more frequently, you are increasing the rate at which the beans are roasting. Okay, so if you turn your drum speed down, it's going to have a profound impact on both the rate at which you're roasting as well as the air temperatures that you're experiencing. 
you turn your drum speed up, once again, profound impact on all of those things. So that's why we're going to talk about drum speed. So by lowering your drum speed, we're changing two things, the height and frequency of the lifting of the beans, which means the coffee will be removing less energy from the air as it's passing through the roaster, which results in a higher exhaust temperature because we're pulling less energy from the air, so our exhaust temp is going to go up, a lower bean rate of rise max and a turning point, uh, and it's going to require us to use more burner in order to create a similar style of roasting. So here you can see one roast with 100% or sorry, this one's with a little bit lower air. You can see, uh, or sorry, drum speed. My drum is turned down to 45 amps in this instance. Um, gas nine, airflow 100, just left the airflow the same the whole time and did burner adjustments. Um, by increasing the drums, but that's a duplicate. I apologize. So here you can see full drum speed, which is at 60 amps. And you'll notice that the air temperature is significantly closer to the beam temperature as opposed to the first one. In case you didn't see that, let's look at that side by side. Uh, these aren't matched particularly well, as you can see. Um, but what happened was I was roasting along. Uh, the blue line here has the highest uh, drum speed, and you can see it roasts significantly faster. These are roasted to the same color, but it's beside the point. Uh, with the slower drum speed, cutting it down to 45 amps instead of 60, you can see that my air temperature is significantly higher than my beam temperature. And I was just struggling to get that coffee to roast. And so we hit first crack right around the time we ended the other one uh, and then had a little bit more of a development time length on there. So drum speed changes the ratio of convection and conduction that's happening in the roaster, which gives you a profound impact on how the airflow is actually roasting the beans, which is why we're including drum speed ever so slightly in an airflow discussion. The way that I approach drum speed is this. I almost always choose the highest drum speed I can without causing centrifuge or causing beans to get sucked into the exhaust because I want to maximize the energy that I'm pulling from the air. Uh, it also helps me finesse things a little bit more, but you know, that's a story for another day, right? So it allows me to roast more quickly, more efficiently. Um, I have better control uh, and it gives me better uniformity. If your drum speed is too low, this is, doesn't mean low. If your drum speed is too low, you can actually have coffee that is roasted uh, alongside the coffee that is still in the process of roasting because the agitation is too little, too much contact with the outside surface of the drum, not enough convection, all that sort of thing. But to dive more into drum speed, we can talk about all that later at some point, right? So the question, should I adjust my drum speed mid-roast to change the convection-conduction relationship? No. No, you shouldn't. Uh, because when you're changing your drum speed mid-roast, what happens is, and this is kind of a fun experiment, is started a roast, turn my drum speed down to 50% randomly, turn it back up to 100% randomly, and you can see what happens. By turning it down to 50%, we stop absorbing energy from the air. Boom, my air temp shoots up, my rate of rise rockets downward. By turning the drum speed back up, my rate of rise goes back up, and my air temp drops down as we go along. So um, part of the reason that I say no is also this. When you change your drum speed, you're changing the way in which the beans potentially are covering the bean probe thermocouple, which can change your bean temperature readings. And so by editing your drum speed bit roast, you're probably changing a lot of variables. And you know, this might be very disappointing, but I like to keep things really simple. Um, I prefer less variables when roasting. There's already so much that goes on in terms of just your day-to-day -day variables uh, with your ambient conditions when you're roasting. I, I don't really want to mess around with other stuff. So. All right. So yeah, don't mess with your drum speed. If you want to, that's fine. But if you're if you're asking me for my opinion, my opinion is set your drum speed and then forget it. Like a Ron Popeil rotisserie. And I don't know if we can reference Ron Popeil on the Roast Magazine thing, but you can just cut that out later. All right, roasting defects. So this is tipping. Tipping is a roasting defect that occurs primarily from roasting a coffee too quickly. If you see tipping showing up on your coffee, it is usually just due to the fact that you have a lower density coffee that you're roasting faster than that coffee would really like to get roasted. And so typically speaking, uh, I'm not intended, if you slow down, the tipping will stop being a problem. Um, so tipping is usually then related to convection because the only way that you can roast a coffee fast enough is by using convection. It's not necessarily that you've got so much air going through it. I remember when I first started roasting, somebody said that uh, the air is just moving through the bean so fast that it just blows out the other side. Don't think that's the case. 
Um, what's probably happening is that because of how heat impacts the coffee, uh, the tips are particularly susceptible and the tip where the embryo uh, was going to germinate is obviously very susceptible as you can see here. And so we, we have some scorching happening there that's not happening on the rest of the bean because the heat energy is too high. So by lowering your heat energy input, you're able to avoid this and that's just going to slow your roast down. So we say by slowing down, you avoid the tipping defect. Scorching, which you can see here, illustrated by these brown dots, kind of scattered all about. Uh, scorching is going to be more related to conduction. So why are we talking about it in, in an airspeed lecture? Well, the reason is this, when you lower your airspeed, it changes the way in which the air is distributing and pulling heat off the metal inside the system. And so if you lower your fan speed, if you lower your airspeed, the air isn't going to be, the, the illustration I like to use because I like food, uh, is spreading butter on toast. The air is kind of like spreading that heat out like butter on toast, right? It's kind of helping diffuse that heat across the metal. It's pulling heat energy off the metal and taking it up through the system. Uh, if your airflow is too low, then you've got the globby butter on your toast, which nobody's really looking for, uh, you know, or you just don't care enough to spread it in the morning, but that's whatever. Um, so by not having enough airflow, you have the possibility of creating hot spots. You also have the possibility of overheating the metal. If you increase your airflow, what that's going to do is it's going to help spread that heat energy out a little bit, and it's going to help prevent hot spots uh, from forming on the metal. Now, that being said, that's not always going to fix scorching, but in the case of what we're discussing relative to airflow, it could. So let's talk about another defect, but it's not really a rose defect, but it is something that's a bit of a rumor. And I just want to kind of touch on this um, in our industry. We often say things that aren't true, as if they were true. And uh, some of those things definitely bother me in terms of, you know, drawing uh, concepts out of one-off experiences or not having any scientific data, stuff like that. Um, I'm probably as guilty as anybody else. However, uh, I do want to work on one rumor that's associated around airflow that just always kind of drives me a little bit nuts. Does airflow change flavor? Interesting question, right? Currently, there's no real evidence that shows that it does. Because what you would have to do to set up this experiment would be you'd have to take a coffee, you'd have to roast it so that all the chemical reactions hit at the exact same time, so that you got the same whole bean and ground color coming out, and then do chemical analysis or flavor analysis on it to see if the airflow actually impacted the flavor or not. And getting that same whole bean and ground color is probably the trickier thing. So we'll dive into that. Uh, at least I should say, I don't, I've never been presented with evidence that yes, uh, airspeed does change flavor. Airspeed can change color. Uh, airspeed can change uh, roast timings, development time. It can change a lot of things because it's changing the way that heat transfer is moving through the system, but it may or may not actually be changing uh, the flavor of the coffee if all of those other variables were held constant, right? So this is the this is all joking. Uh, so hopefully you enjoy the tongue in cheek. Try out the coffee faster. This means your coffee is going to get too dry, you monster. Therefore, your coffee is going to taste dry. I hope that you're happy, right? Um, so there's a couple things I want to to look at with that. Oh, here's I love this graphic. It's just you know the devil himself. Too much airflow coming in to destroy what you've been working on in your roaster. So uh, in my mind, these are unsubstantiated assumptions that all airflow dries coffee out. It depends on how moist the airflow is, right? Um, coffee starts at about eight to 12% moisture content. And the air in my facility right now is about 43%. It's kind of dry in here because we're running an electric heater, um, 43%. But that's still significantly higher percentage wise than coffee. Uh, the air outside right now of my house is 77% moisture content, which is significantly higher than coffee. And inside the roasting chamber, it's going to be different because it depends on how the combustion is going or what kind of roasting system you actually are using, whether you're using gas, electric, what have you. All of that's going to impact how moist the air is moving through the system. If you're dealing with a recirculating roaster, your air is probably significantly moister than if you're dealing with a single pass roaster, right? 
Um, so it depends a lot on that. It's going to depend a lot on how porous or permeable the substance that we're discussing is. So if you have a very, very porous coffee versus a very, very dense coffee, you're probably going to see some major differences there. Um, so I think that at best, the idea that airflow dries out coffee is going to be roaster and climate dependent. It isn't a blanket statement we can just say across the board, right? Um, another thing, that coffee drying out is problematic. Um, is it? Because our goal is to get coffee down from 8 to 12% moisture content down to 1 to 3% by the end of the roast. Um, so drying it out is kind of unavoidable. Uh, and the Maillard reaction, for example, doesn't like to happen in the presence of water. So you have to remove some of the water content in order to get some of these sugar browning reactions to actually start happening in the first place. And even then, if we're talking about all of this, we're probably only talking about surface water content. And there might be some osmosis happening from the core, but the surface is going to be somewhat isolated because of the density of the coffee. In a lot of the articles that I've, I've seen and, and read, what, what you see more is that the drying and the rate of drying of coffee depends on the rate of heat application. right? And as we've talked about, uh, lower air can actually cause heat application to increase, which is going to change the rate of drying. And uh, higher airflow can cause uh, heat energy in the system, which can cause the roast to go longer, which could potentially prolong drying. Um, so I think that there's a lot of things that we're not really completely clearly thinking through. Uh, and then the other part of this problem is, you know, we don't really have any evidence that shows that dry coffee equals dry flavor in the cup um, either. At least I've not been exposed to any, but I do welcome the dialogue. Right? So, so another question, does airflow actually dry the coffee out? Let's take a peek. So these are the first two roasts that I did. Uh, you'll notice that I took a lot of measurements. Uh, these are two days worth of moisture measurements. Uh, I was using the Sinar Bean Pro. Uh, my Sinar Bean Pro has the option for roasted whole bean and roasted ground coffee. And so this is all the whole bean measurements from the first two. And you can see, so 947 is 100% airflow, 948 is 50% airflow. Based on the average, they're about 0.1% different moisture content. So 0.1% possibly leaning toward it being a little bit more moist with lower airflow. But the median and the mode are both exactly the same, okay? So average, median, mode, just kind of zooming in to get a little bit more clarity. The median and mode are basically the same and the average is only 0.1% different. So they're very, very close to each other in terms of the overall dryness of the coffee at the end of the roast. Uh, I included 949, which is the one that I re-roasted just yesterday. Um, you can, and here you can see ground measurements as well. So on the ground measurement, uh, ground to a cupping setting, uh, 947 was actually more moist. So the one with 100% airflow was ever so slightly more moist, insignificantly so I would say, uh, than 948. Um, so there was whole bean measurements. Uh, these were the averages. And then the fresh measurements averages. Uh, here you can see 949 came at 3.6 and 4.55. However, I retook 949 this morning. I did, put, I did put a little tag in here. And my average actually came out to uh, 3.43 uh, for whole bean and 4.4 for ground. So, yeah, seems like potentially at least between 100% and 50% airflow on my three kilo USRC, hitting the same colors, hitting basically the same profile, not really a significant moisture difference based on my readings. Now, once again, that's the disclaimer based on my readings, right? Uh, perhaps with an order of magnitude, different airflow. So let's look very briefly at fluid bed versus drum. I don't wanna to spend too much time on this because I also wanna be sensitive to timing and make sure we have time for questions because I've seen you populating questions up there and I'm happy to get to those. So what do we know about fluidized bed versus drum? We know that the fluidized bed has a significantly higher airflow. So traditional roaster, uh, somewhere between, and the only way I could think to do a comparison because the, the metric that I used for the airflow on a fluidized bed was actually graciously given to me by the folks at Akala. And so, um, 0.30 to 0 0.12 CFM per gram. 
So that's taking larger roasters and dividing how many cubic feet per minute of air are moving per gram of coffee that's inside the roaster. And so drum roasters are pretty big variations. So anywhere from 0 0.032 to 0 0.012. Um, well, it's hailing here. If you lose me internet wise, I'll be joining uh, back by my phone just in case we live out in the sticks a little bit. So you never really know what's going to happen, but I'll be back if I do drop off. And then uh, the fluidized bed machines uh, closer to 0 0.2 CFM per gram. That's over six times more airflow, at least in the Akawa, than in a traditional drum roaster. Uh, and this is traditional drum roaster all the way up to Laura, so which is on the higher side of CFM. Um, and I compared everything from, you know, uh, I think I had information from USRC, Probat, um, San Franciscan, uh, Loring, all those types of roasters. So we've kind of got like a large swath included in this, this mixture. And so thanks everybody for giving me uh, all that data. But, but basically what I'm saying is this, when you were talking about airflow and fluidized bed versus drum, there's a significant difference. When we're talking about drum versus drum, it's a very small difference, okay? Relatively speaking. What don't we know yet? Uh, we don't know if this is moisture or flavor. Uh, I, w I wasn't able to do anything. I wasn't able to find much of anything about it. Um, there is one article, which I'm going to reference next, which has some information comparing fluidized bed versus drum, but they self-admit their profiles weren't perfect in terms of matching. Um, so does this impact it? We don't really know. Um, we should research that, probably. This, however, was a really fun article, uh, Coffee Roasting and Aroma Formation, Application of Different Time and Temperature Conditions. Using a temperature profile on a laboratory scale fluidized bed roaster, which approximated temperature profile on a traditional drum, similar results were obtained for physical properties and aroma formation in the resulting coffees, which means drum versus lab fluid bed roaster, they got them to work so that they were able to produce something very similar to one another. And they even say that the temperature increase uh, at the first stage was too fast uh, in profile roasting, which for them profile roasting means on the fluidized bed roaster, but controlled. Uh, than in the drum roasting, so they think they could even get better if they had a lower rate of temperature rise at the beginning of the roast. It is therefore possible to transfer roasting conditions of a traditional horizontal drum roaster to a fluidized bed system, but roasting time would not be reduced if the roaster wants to produce a coffee of similar flavor properties. So that's really cool. Y'all should go read this article and check it out. I'm sure that there's you know, possibilities of there being articles that are out to the contrary, but I like to see that people are kind of thinking in this vein where roasting is temperature over time. Right? Let's not overcomplicate things. It's mostly temperature over time. Now, what I will say is that when you're on a fluidized bed roaster, you have to be very cognizant of how much airflow you're using, especially at the end of the roast, because one of the things that's difficult, in my personal opinion, to reproduce is the whole bean to ground color distribution that you can sometimes get on a drum roaster. You do seem to have a little bit easier time finessing. It's not that you can't finesse it on a collar, because you can, or on a fluidized bed roaster or whatever. It's just a little bit more uh, you have to think about it a bit more. So your whole bean to ground spread, if you want, for example, a 60 or let's say a 70 agtron whole bean with a, a 110 agtron ground fine for espresso, uh, that can be pretty easy to simulate on a drum. It can be a little bit more difficult unless you know what you're doing to do on a fluidized bed roaster. But that's just because you've got so much hot air flow moving throughout the beans the entirety of the roast uh, that what I have often seen in my own roasting, and that's not to say that this is everybody, but what I've seen in my own roasting is my whole beans to, to ground uh, color spreads are usually a little bit bigger on fluidized bed. But figured out some ways to, to combat that, so we'll talk about that later. Let's bring it all together, shall we? How do I approach doing airflow changes at roasting? This is all just straight opinion. This is how I think about it. You can agree, disagree. That's completely up to you. Okay. Uh, possible issues with airflow adjustment. So sometimes when you're making an airflow adjustment, it can cause you an issue regarding heat transfer within the roast, especially if you're aiming for a constant declining rate of rise. And the reason for it is if you go from low airflow to high airflow, you go from having all this heat energy built up on the metal to grabbing all that heat energy from the metal and from the hot box and shoving it through the drum all at once. And so what you'll notice sometimes is, make sure I'm going the right direction here, as you're going down in your rate of rise, if you make an airflow adjustment, sometimes you can see a little blip up in your rate of rise, which is basically the beans accelerate and then go back into line. The reason for this, brief acceleration and then return uh, to the line is because you're taking all that heat energy in the hot box and in the metal and you're dumping it through the beans all at once when you go from low to high airflow. If you're aiming for a constant heat application, quick adjustments to airflow can also be problematic. On the next two slides, we're gonna see how rapid airflow adjustments can pull the heat from the metal 
in, uh, and the influx of more hot air can cause the beans to temporarily accelerate, or at least the bean probe thermocouple, right? So we don't know if the beans are actually doing it or not. Here you can see, uh, it's a bit of a noisy probe on this one, but you can see a bit of a kick up right here. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. So the airflow adjustment to 100 was made right here. There we've got the kick up in terms of the rate of rise, and then everything kind of settles back down. Here you can see a similar sort of thing. Once again, airflow 200 kicks up and then comes back down. Um, these are both related to just dumping a whole bunch of hot air through at once, okay? So how do you hide your airflow adjustments? Um, you can hide your airflow adjustments uh, if you're aiming for a constant declining rate of rise or something like that. If you are not, that's cool either way. Two different methods I'd propose to you. One, smaller incremental airspeed adjustments. So doing a step adjustment, not just like from almost nothing to 100. Uh, or you can hide your airflow adjustment in the fall. Why do you want to do this? So you can poke, post your sick roasting curves to social media, obviously. Uh, so you can ensure the coffee has a more uniform heating experience, maybe. Uh, and mostly just because it's awesome, right? So let's talk about that. Here you can see a step adjustment. Uh, I go from 75% airflow to 100% airflow. It's not major. It's not like taking a huge amount of time, but I'm not going from 50% to 100%. I'm just kind of dragging it out a little bit. Um, so this allows you to avoid some of that kickback and have a, a you know, enjoyable roast, right? Not that any of these were not enjoyable. Uh, or you can hide it in the fall. If you want to do a dramatic airflow adjustment, you want to hide it somewhere before yellowing as you're falling down from your highest point of your rate of rise curve because you're, you're declining the rate of rise from that initial oomph is so uh, strong that you can actually hide your airflow adjustment in it. So if you make your airflow adjustment before yellowing or around yellowing, uh, you can hide that little blip that you might see uh, in everything else. So for me, if it's a longer wrist, I'll usually do one of the following. I'll keep a stable fan speed for the entire roast because why introduce new variables when you don't have to? Uh, we have this really weird belief, I think in coffee roasting that the coffee only tasted good because of all the adjustments I did. When the reality is probably that the coffee tastes good because you hit the right time temperature conditions and you ended with the right holding and ground color for what you're aiming for. Um, or what I'll do is I'll do a stepped fan decrease in order to prevent jumps in heat being applied to the coffee. If I'm roasting a shorter style of roast, I tend to prefer to bury the adjustment in the fall because I'm already going to be hitting with a really high max rate of rise because I'm pushing everything really fast. It's just nice to do. And that's it. Uh, that kind of takes us to the end of the presentation.